Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second webinar of DEI Awareness Week Beyond a Title Change The True Ask of DEI Leaders. Uh, my name is James Swart, and I'm the Director of Education and Leadership Development for the National Apartment Association. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping points. Uh, today's session is being recorded and will be posted on the NAA website and YouTube channel later this week. We've allotted time at the end of today's session for questions and answers. Uh, feel free to submit questions using the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen or the chat box at any time during today's session. I also wanna take a moment to thank the Home Depot Pro for their sponsorship of this year's DEI Awareness Week. We are grateful for their partnership with NAA. And with that, I am excited to turn it over to Monica Frazier. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I am super ecstatic, and I'm sure that Crystal is too, to be here today with you all to talk about the true ask for DEI leaders, which is beyond a title change. So we're going to dig a little bit into that. But first, for those of us uh, who don't know who we are, we do also want to make sure you know kind of a little bit about us and what we have to contribute in regards to this topic. So James, next slide. I, my name is Monica Frazier. I am the general manager for Midwood Investment and Development. I come with over 10 years of multifamily and commercial property management experience. If you know me, I am also the founder of Melanin and Multifamily, which is an affinity group, which again leans on to the DEI leadership perspective we'll talk about today. I am a DLP graduate, woot woot, <laughs> and an NAA Excellence Award nominee of two years in a row. Um, I also am what I like to call call a professional volunteer. I am chair of my PAA D and I committee since 2020 and have served on the advisory board since 2018. And I've also served for the last two years within the NAA. So I'm very happy to be here. I'll pass it back to Crystal. Thank you, Monica. As Monica said, I am Crystal Dukes. I am the Director of Education and Training uh, with Real Source Properties, uh, and I have been in the industry for a little over 18 years. Um, it's still kind of weird <laughs> to say that out loud, uh, but I joined Real Source Properties in 2016 as the Director of Education and Training, and honestly, it was um, probably a year ago where I added the DE&I component um, to my title and my responsibilities. Um, currently, I oversee the design and implementation um, of all of our onboarding initiatives, leadership development, succession planning, uh, and mentoring programs, um, in addition to the DE&I. Uh, I am also a graduate of the Diversity Leadership Program and a current leadership lyceum participant. Um, and I serve on the NAA's DEI committee, uh, the Apartment Association of Greater Columbia's DEI committee, and I'm a mentor for the Diversity Leadership Program. So very excited. Shout out to Gary, uh, my mentee. So excited to have you all here with us. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about why we're here today. Thank you, James, for advancing. We're going to tell you about why we're here. And the real reason that we are here is to offer you a little bit of perspective. Okay, so um, the first thing we want to do is to put a lens um, on what your new DEI leader might experience um, when cultivating DEI within an organization. And I apologize, but my mouse is doing something weird. It's gotten attached to the Zoom and it's not working for me. So let's try this. There we go. Also, we're going to turn it over to Monica to learn what it takes to foster engagement um, and promote growth within the affiliate and lead a program that thrives. It's not enough just to have um, a DEI program or a committee. You have to create one that actually thrives, that has an impact and is lasting. Um, and then we're going to come back together and we're going to provide you with ways to support your DEI leaders um, in their roles and help build your inclusive workspace. Um, you can advance the slide. Thank you. So we're going to talk about some of the top barriers to diversity, equity, and inclusion progress. So your DEI leaders are experiencing mass burnout. Um, this burnout is driven by low engagement, low budgets, lackluster support from management, and a general sense of performative activism that can be very, very discouraging. Um, a report published by McLean and Company in 2023 actually indicates some of the top barriers to DEI progress, and they are as follows. 
those. Uh, the first, of course, is not enough time um, for dedicated DEI work. 59% of the respondents stated that they do not have enough time um, for dedicated DEI work. And that is so important, especially for those leaders, um, DEI leaders within your organization uh, that have multiple job responsibilities. Um, next, insufficient resources and funding. 43% of the respondents uh, stated this is one of the top barriers to DEI progress. So if you're in the DEI world um, or you've had if you read about it, you'll notice that there is a lot of DEI funding um, that is being cut. And it sometimes is the first to go um, when you're looking at, at cutting the budget when it was such a priority only a few years ago. Um, so it's very, very important to realize that that is a barrier for us to continue moving forward. And then lastly, thank you, 29% uh, of the respondents said um, it's lack of leadership support. So it's all great when you're creating this program and you're saying, yes, we want to do it. It's another thing to continue to support it throughout the progress. And when your DEI leaders lose that support, it is overwhelming and it really could make or break your DEI program. Uh, you can go ahead and advance it. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what it looks like um, from your DEI leader. Um, within your company's perspective, okay? So your company has made the choice to be more intentional. Oh, not just yet. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so your company has made the choice to be more intentional in their efforts to create and uphold DEI practices. Um, and the research is already so extensive uh, surrounding the benefits of DEI. Uh, you have among them a better bottom line. You have innovation, happier residents, an expanded talent pool, um, employee retention, better business reputation, and the list goes on and on. So we know it's the thing to do, and they know it's the thing to do. But who leads the charge? Right, that is the question. So we wanna take a moment and um, I want some audience participation here. Uh, that chat box is working. Um, Monica is checking that for us. Um, I'm gonna ask a question. So how many of you on the call are yourselves or have someone within your organization leading your DE&I charge that has other job responsibilities? So for example, I am the Director of Education Training and DEI Strategies. So again, take a moment and please use that chat box. Let us know if you yourself are, or you have someone in your organization leading the DEI charge that has other main job responsibilities. And Monica, if you could let me know if anyone puts anything in there. I will watch it. I see Tyler has says yes. So we're starting to get some responses. Shay, Heather, Corey, and several others. Todd yeah. is also a DEI chair. Oh, the chat's going crazy. It seems that there's a big, uh, a big response to those who also share those uh, responsibilities. For sure. And this often happens. Um, for me, a personal, a personal story is I had been having experiences in my workplace that were uncomfortable or left me feeling like I didn't belong. Um, but I didn't have the words or the space to express what I was experiencing. And this was very difficult for me um, until I took part in the diversity leadership uh, uh, program, which is a plug, and um, because everybody should be taking part in that if you can. Um, but I had the opportunity to take part in this wonderful program, and it was life changing for me. Um, it helped me learn how to use my voice um, and to be a better leader. And I made the decision to take on the role of DEI leader within my organization. So we had some conversations um, with the VP of operations and then the senior vice president. Um, and we decided that, you know, we wanted to move forward with this. Um, but the choice for your new DEI leader, the choice to become active, it really is a do or die moment. And it is a do or die moment for any um, inclusive leader. Uh, just the idea that that being a part of DEI and moving it forward, this choice comes with more risk because you are more visibly taking action. So doing things in the background is one thing, cheering it on in the background is another, but leading it, being vocal, being visible, it is something 
that does come with an amount of risk. And I actually believe that Monica's going to get a little bit of into that um, a little bit later on in the session as well. Um, but it was Jennifer Brown, and I'm not sure if everyone has read this, but Jennifer Brown is the author of How to Be um, an Inclusive Leader. And uh, she said, inclusiveness starts with the spark to do better. The spark lives inside leaders, almost like a pilot light. It's always there, ready and waiting to create a bigger flame. And when I read that, there was something in me and it was like, yeah, I have that. I'm ready. Um, you know, I, it's, it's just waiting there and I can do it. Little did I know <laughs> what was going to come with that. And that's what we kind of want to talk to you about today, because you often don't know what your DEI leaders are experiencing. Um, and James, you can go ahead and you can advance. I'll try to advance as well. Thank you. Um, so like I said, the choice to become active is a do or die moment for anyone who's aspiring to be an inclusive leader. I um, mean, it really starts with the inner work. And when I say that, I, what I'm trying to say is that unpacking past experiences or confronting fears can be emotionally taxing for your DEI leaders. Every microaggression, every act of performative allyism, everything, it dims that, that light, that pilot light, that spark just a little bit more. And it's important to understand that. And I kind of want to talk about some of the experiences that your DEI leaders can have. Um, you can advance. So we want to start with the microaggressions. Recounting every microaggression experience can be dimming for your DEI leaders. And um, for those of you who don't know, to put it simply, microaggressions are a reflection of implicit bias, um, stereotypes or prejudices that are outside the level of one's conscious awareness. Okay, so they reflect unconscious worldviews of inclusion, exclusion, superiority, and inferiority. Okay, and they've shown up often throughout my career and honestly in my life. So um, for me personally, one of the most common was, wow, you're very well spoken. Or you, you speak very well, um, which is said in a way to, to assume that someone like me cannot speak the way that I speak, which was something I received all the time. Um, or to take it a little bit further, something I experienced is you sound white. You're hearing that all of the time. Um, and it's important to understand that there are different layers to DEI. Um, microaggressions aren't just oppressed versus oppressor. Sometimes it's a matter of intersectionality. Um, and this is just a personal example for me. But understanding that your DEI leaders are faced with this is very, very important. Okay. And and to, to even continue with that, um, entering into a corporate workspace, it showed up um, in environmental microaggressions, like being the only person of color in the room, or there being no people of color in the room, which can sometimes feel like the message is be, being sent that they don't belong. But I knew I belonged, but it was a journey. And for your DEI leaders, it can also be. Um, you can go ahead and advance, James. Thank you. And this kind of merged directly into the oppression from being the first or the only person like me in the room. So in this situation, two things can often happen. First, for your DEI leader, um, especially if they represent a marginalized group, there's a weight um, because now it feels like those who do not understand the complexities of DEI may expect your leader to speak for all marginalized groups as if their feelings on certain matters speaks to everyone's feelings um, a, an, in a certain group. And that is not the case. Um, two, for me, I was the only person of color in the room. Finding my voice and trying to balance not being so passionate with not offending um, anyone who has questions was difficult. Your DEI leaders will experience this. You push too hard and everyone stops listening. You don't push hard enough or you know you don't speak up enough and it makes it seem like the issues such as lack of diverse hiring practices or not celebrating 
or acknowledging cultural holidays can be okay. So finding that balance is very important and it does take some time for your new DEI leader. And there's also the pressure of making sure that the work that you do sets the tone for having a diverse perspective and creating these inclusive workspaces um, that it must be the norm moving forward. So you want to make sure that you have made an impression, you made an impact. And with the reduction of um, DEI leaders in the workplace um, and decreased funding, showing the value of DEI programs is very important and, and is a weight for your new DEI leader. Um, James, you can advance. Thank you. And that also goes into feeling voiceless. Now, in the midst of, of everything that you have going on, there's a fair surrounding expressing your discomfort. Um, for me, I had to find my voice as a DEI leader. I was no longer just speaking up for myself. I was now choosing to speak up and create spaces for all of the associates within my company to where they could speak up as well. Um, for everyone who would be impacted, it kind of felt like it was on my shoulders to make, to make sure I made the space for them. Um, so there can be a fear surrounding this process, speaking up. There can be a discomfort for your new DEI leader, how to speak up, when to speak up, am I doing enough? Um, all of this can play in the background and it's important for you to understand that this is something that your new DEI leader can be experiencing. James, you can advance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and to speak to Jennifer Brown again, um, in the book, she mentions an inclusion continuum. And that consists of moving from being unaware to aware to active to being an advocate. And I do encourage everyone on the call who has not read that book to please, please do so. Um, it is an amazing book. But for your DEI leader, there's a huge amount of, of awareness that can take place and it can lead to feelings of guilt or shame. So it may require your DEI leader to acknowledge their own inner discomforts and the experiences that led to them, um, or that led them to experience them. Um, and in addition to those overwhelming uh, realizations, they may have feelings of shame or guilt about missed opportunities, whether it was to speak up for themselves or for someone else. Um, and as a leader within multifamily, I can tell you when I came to that realization, there was a lot of guilt and shame um, because there were so many times where I could have spoken up for myself or someone else and I didn't. That was a missed opportunity and it was very hard to internalize, but it had to happen. Um, honestly, this stage awakens your own limitations. Um, and it asks that you activate in order to change, uh, to make the change for yourself and your workplace. All right, you can advance, James. So DEI burnout is real. That's it. That's the message. Everyone on this call should know it's real. But really, let's dive into it just a little bit more. Um, James, you can advance the slide. So one of the uh, main causes of DE&I burnout is the sheer amount of work involved in the efforts. It takes so much to have a robust DE&I and for other people, DEIB program, okay? Um, one of the things I want to address, uh, James, you can advance, is time. So many of your DE&I leaders are already in very high performing positions and it demands so much of their time that it feels like we already don't have enough of it. How are we going to fit this DE and I work into this? Um, for me, adding that additional component of DE and I felt like when I moved the needle in one area, whether it was education and training, it moved back or stayed in place, which is not what I wanted for another. The time it took to find that balance was so important. So there's a little bit of that stumbling. <laughs> in the beginning. Um, James, you can advance. Thank you. Energy. So your DEI leader is already giving so much of themselves already. For an example, the dynamic of the relationship between the associates changed once I took on the new position. Okay, there was an immense amount um, and there is an immense amount of vulnerability and honesty that comes with the work of DEI. And when you're honest, when you're vulnerable, when you are telling your stories, people feel as though they can also tell you theirs. They have a place to come. They trust you with that information, with their experiences, with giving you what they need from our company to feel like they belong. And that takes so much energy. There was so much time 
that I needed just to process everything that I had heard and figure out how we're going to move forward. So understanding that your DEI leader experiences this is very, very important and that they do need the time to process. Um, James, you can advance it. And lastly, resources. Your DEI leader does not have all of the answers. They do not, okay? Please understand that. The research and the time that goes into cultivating a DEI program, it's so much. There's so much to kind of dive through. And understanding this um, will help you gain perspective about what your DEI leader is experiencing when, within your organization. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Monica so she can discuss the perspective of the affiliate DEI leader. And James, you can advance. Wonderful. Thank you, Crystal. I love presenting with people that I know because I learn when I present with them. So I hope that you all grab something from what Crystal said because I'm going to build off of that and speak to the experience of the affiliate perspective. Um, I mentioned before that I've been the chair of the DEI committee for the Pennsylvania Apartment Association. I was there when it was incepted with our previous president and have been carrying it out since. So what I hope to contribute today is a little bit more of uh, the experience that your leaders and your affiliate may be having that other committee members, committee leaders are just not experiencing and, and what ways you can do to not only recognize it, but then create spaces and opportunities to kind of balance and create equity in those issues. So um, James, you can advance the next slide. So the first thing I wanna talk about what Crystal kind of led with is like having a program is great, but having a program that thrives is ultimately the goal. So when we think about what it takes to foster engagement, keep retention, right? What it takes to promote growth, perfect timing, we're considering two things. We think about a seat at the table, there's been people who maybe historically been marginalized, never had a seat at that table. And we see that across organizations and affiliates, that space is being made at tables. But there's, that doesn't really mean too much to sit at a table where your voice maybe isn't heard, it isn't valued, it doesn't have the same authority or weight that other people at the table may have. Your representation to Crystal's point might be a microaggression and you might feel a sense of oneness. All of those things kind of um, minimize the impact of presenting a seat at that table. So what we're seeing in the landscape is that many organizations are making space for DEI programs, but there's still a very strong glass ceiling that's really preventing these leaders to make change, to be involved in decision making, to really become a part of the fabric of what it means to be a part of your association. So let's talk about some of the unique lifts that some of these leaders may experience. James, you can click over. The first thing I want to talk about is the fostering engagement portion, which completely lies in the ability for the leaders to be involved. And Crystal did mention this, and I love talking about it, is that these leaders, myself included, are going through instances where we're risking social capital. You're probably wondering, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to out myself, right, for being a public disruptor. I may say things that other people don't want to hear me say or are afraid to say, and I might say things and pronounce um, feelings that go against status quo. And that can be uncomfortable for an entire organization, right? Who maybe has feelings of committing to DE&I, but aren't really sure what they're sacrificing to do so. Um, the second part of that would be tokenism or trailblazing. So if you're not familiar with the concept of tokenism, it's really that whole um, I'm going to put somebody of color on my staff to check the box off for DEI so no one can say anything about me not promoting DEI initiatives. That's like an example. But what happens for the leaders is that that theme of tokenism is actually absorbed by them and the people around them because of fear, right? The fear of making mistakes or um, having poor representation on a certain message, or simply the fear of not having the resources, time, and everything else Crystal said before to present a message. So we will lean on the marginalized folks, we'll lean on the DEI leaders who have volunteered and sort of support the oneness that it takes to be a leader in that space. 
rather than looking at these leaders as dynamic leaders who can take untraditional pathways to success, lead others to that, and really help innovate and create sustainability practices that increase your membership. Now, again, I'm, I'm focusing a lot on the affiliate perspective, but this same thing happens within organizations. I'm sure Crystal can speak to it, where people perceive uh, a you a different way than necessarily you're trying to navigate. James, you can go ahead and click the next one. All right, relationship building. So going back to what it takes to foster and promote growth um, has everything to do with your DEI's leader to build relationships. I've found the most success in, these, in this strategy because of how people oriented our businesses. So first thing, I have to ask the chat because the chat is live, I love it. What is code switching to you? And if you don't know what code switching is, you can put a question mark emoji or a question mark in the chat. But if you have any ideas on what code switching is, let me know now. Christy says she knows. Jessica said, let her know. Okay, Marcy, Sloan. Right, so for those who don't know, I'm gonna do something transformative. You, you hear the voice that I have, you hear the words that I say, but when I switch up my voice, you're going to hear it drop out. You're going to hear slang. You're going to hear hard R's because I'm from the Midwest and that's how we talk, right? But if I'm code switching, if I'm entering landscapes that are often professional or maybe unknown to me, I may assimilate myself in ways so that I am perceived to be more educated, more tenured, more experienced, or maybe just I want to be respected the same. And I don't want any barrier to Crystal's point, someone telling me how articulate I sound. Right, or someone telling me how I sound like a white person. And all to say is that that is a level of involvement that your DEI leaders are experiencing every day to make sure that they can build these relationships without any negative impacts. So that kind of leads me into my second part, which is really about presence and positionality, right? Another big part of how DEI leaders within affiliates can be successful is by showing up. And you know how hard it is to show up sometimes? After you've been code switching for nine to 10 hours a day, now you have to go to a, an event or an educational session, whatever that might look like as with your affiliate, and you're exhausted, but your presence matters. Why? To Crystal's point, you're representing maybe marginalized people and to see you in the space, I'm telling you all, it makes a crazy impact, but that takes energy. Positionality also has to do with, am I making relationships with the right people in the organization to affect change? Am I aligning myself with the right voices? Have I figured out how, who those people are and do they even know their voice on the situations and themes that I might be presenting? And so relationship building is a huge component of that, that again, other affiliate committee members or leaders maybe aren't experiencing. And that all kind of adds into the value add. I talked a lot about the negative, but here's the positive about relationship building. Affiliate DEI leaders are reconnecting members to the organization. I know there's affiliate people in the chat. I know membership is hard, retention is hard, engagement is hard, but representation, uplifting unheard voices, again, value adds to the organization. James, you can go ahead. All right, well, what do they, what Spider-Man's uncle say? With that great power comes great responsibility. And so there's a pushback against the pushback that leaders are experiencing. Go ahead, James, you can click the first one. So oftentimes when a committee is just getting started or a task force, because not everything starts off as a committee, right? A task force or a group is starting to talk about DEI with an affiliate. The first thing that they get pushback from is the perception of DEI within that affiliate, right? One of the number one things that I experience in the space, even being very public on who I am and what I do, is sometimes leaders are having a perceived erasure of tenure. Crystal has 18 years of experience. I'm sure she's entered spaces where that respect was not necessarily given, right? Um, whereas in other situations or committees or places that you participate, that might be unsaid and almost revered to a certain point. Oftentimes DEI leaders have that bias uh, erase their tenure and industry experience. So the undue burden of that is constant education, constant awareness, having to do the heavy lift of educating people, whether it's on certain terms or phenomenons, just to have the conversation about change, just to have the conversation about awareness, right? And I'm going to lean back to what I said earlier is the perceived threat of status quo, my spell check, sorry, y'all. Uh, so that should be status quo, 
and what I say to that is some people feel threatened by change, period, right? Then you then you add aspects of things that change separate from their own perspectives, right? That's a perceived threat. And so when people feel like things are changing too quickly and they don't understand or we're doing new things we've never done before, that can feel threatening and uncomfortability. Go ahead, James. All right, so I love to talk about equity pie. Let's assume when America was built, we also had a really big oven and we and we baked an equity pie. But unfortunately, some people did not get their fair share of a slice and other people got huge slices, probably more than they could do with, right? And then America started. So equity pie. Over time, organizations are noticing, we're seeing this in current day events, that there are opportunities to reestablish equity and reallocate resources so there's fairness. And really so that everybody gets the right size piece of pie, enough to fill you, right? And so what happens is when a reallocation of that equity pie begins, right? This is more maybe the second level. You Maybe your committee has finally got a vision statement or they have a focus or they're starting to do uh, events or messaging, right? People start to say, what's that DEI stuff all about? They're always talking about DEI, right? And people start to think that you take too, too much space up. Like they think that it's taking too much away from others to have these conversations. So I definitely want to lean on that. It's a fun example to talk about pie, I love pie, but it's also one that's very relevant in trying to understand that it's not really taking a piece of um privilege or advantage from you. It's reallocating that privilege so it's fair for all. And so the pushback you, again you have is also on concerns on fairness. Oftentimes people assume this like affirmative action theme of just because a marginalized person is in a position that they didn't earn it, right? There's a concept of meritocracy that says that this person, that didn't apply to this person. Well, I can tell you most DEI leaders I know are heavily decorated whether that's within their own industry, also within DEI spaces, right? They are they have the skill set to warrant the really respect and um, reward that comes with meritocracy. So again, a pushback you might get is people feeling like things are unfair and feeling people are getting chosen to do things or have privileges that they have not earned. But let me tell you, that is not the case. So let's go ahead, James, one more time. Perfect. Missing tools. So to Crystal's point, um, oftentimes there's a huge lack of leadership support, and I won't dig too much into that. But what I'll say is that if you are an affiliate or just task force, I'm not sure at that point where you're at, if your group does not have true leadership support from not only other committee members and members of your affiliate, but also your board, mm -hmm. also your staff, super impactful to how the rest of the membership of your affiliate sees you act about DEI. DEI is not just the definitions and awareness. It has a huge component of action. And when you do not have that leadership support, it can really make it hard for your committee leaders, committee members, affiliate folks to be impactful. We don't volunteer to be not be impactful. We want to make change. We want to really put our stamp and legacy on things. We need that support. I'm gonna go back up to a point, talk about shared knowledge. Um, Clubhouse is great because I can post something and someone can respond to me, but that's not always an accessible channel for all DEI leaders. You know, accessibility is a huge part of what makes DEI you know, successful and transparent and digestible. And there's not a space yet for affiliate leaders, DEI leaders to communicate to each other, to understand best practices. Even myself, I've had sidebar conversations with many leaders, whether starting their committees um, and looking for advice or wondering where to start. And it's not necessarily advertised or, or shared some of the best practices. So we have to understand that DEI leaders, again, are experiencing these things very separate than other committee members. Go ahead, James. So what does support look like? I'm gonna bring my girl Crystal back into this because we really wanna learn a little bit more about how we can support our team. So Crystal. Absolutely. So we wanna start with the visibility. So you can advance, thanks James. So this is going to be very important. This is how you support your DEI leader. Uh, the success of a DEI program or the creation of an inclusive workspace, it's a very important that your your leaders, your executive team, your C-suite are involved. 
Um, it has to start from the top. And I know you hear that often, but it's true. Executive leaders must be involved in the problem solving process. That way the outcome is a community outcome. So being visible and aligning DEI with business objectives um, is crucial to supporting your DEI leaders. Uh, Harvest Business Review actually knows that CEOs need to take a public stance, embed DEI in the organization's purpose, um, exemplify the culture, and take responsibility for progress towards goals. Um, they need to be out front. Even if you have a chief diversity officer or a DEI leader who is a part of the team, um, it's very, very important that you are out front setting the example um, and showing that there's more to it than saying it, that the work is being done um, on every level. Um, and with that, Monica, do you want to tell us a little bit about allyship and sponsorship? Yes. So two of my favorite words, because similar to the life cycle you described with Kim Brown in the in the book we mentioned earlier, is just understanding when you become an advocate, y'all, y'all are taking the classes, you're being more aware, you're educating yourself. There's an action step. And really DEI work without action is dead. It doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't really build. So allyship is super important. And I, I want to preface this by saying oftentimes people want to assume the title of allyship, but it is something that people place upon you based on your actions, your attitudes, and your advocacy, right? And I'm not saying everybody's always in a position to be an ally immediately in every space, but there are ways that you can have actions of allyship that can promote inclusive and inclusion and belonging. So let me also say that the opposite of backlash is support and endorsement. So if you know that your DEI leader is going through all this and dealing with this backlash, here's an easy answer, allyship, right? The action behind supporting the people doing the work um, that are fighting for the equality and, and equity that comes with maybe injustices that kind of transpose into the workplace. But to go a step further would be sponsorship. And those are for those of us who have the opportunity and privilege to reallocate resources. And that's not only money, but resources and opportunities and mentorship. I, I can think of the many names that are in this group right now that have, have done that for me, right? And that is super important in order for me to be successful. So I share that to say, you know, there's an action that comes with DEI and being present and having that voice, like Crystal said, doing the action part, being visible, but there's also the opportunity for resource allocation. Sometimes I'm not the best to speak about everything, right? Who can I, who can I support and uplift so that they can do that? Um, these are the sort of things we have to ask ourselves. Crystal. So next we have cross collaboration. So companies just starting out on their DEI journeys or facing obstacles um, can tap into resources um, that they already have within their organization to create these inclusive cultures. Um, for for real source properties, our path to a successful DEI program came once our operations and our marketing teams got intentional in their involvement. Um, for me, my role um, in align D, aligning DEI with our company's goals was a focus. But my vice president of operations, Kim Humphrey, understood that her role um, was to be a liaison with the executive team for funding and approval. And she understood that that was just as important. And even so, um, our VP of marketing, Matt Bullock, understood that his role in creating communication visuals to communicate programming to um, our stakeholders, both internal and external, was also important. So we were able to create an environment um, that encouraged continuous learning and it disbanded information silos within the departments. The support was game changing for me and it could be for your DEI leaders as well. Um, and Monica, do you want to talk a little bit about the mutual benefit relationships? Absolutely. So I failed to mention that I'm also currently a Leadership Lyceum uh, member. So shout out to all the Leadership Lyceum folks out there, graduates and current. But one of the themes that we're focusing on this year has to do with association sustainability and the concept of mutual benefit relationships. So think about it like this. All of us probably volunteer at some capacity. You may have intrinsic or extrinsic motivations that keep you doing that. And so what we want to make sure is that these DEI leaders are supported and not just having a one-way um, channel of support, 
right? Not just pouring into the organization, not just showing up for all the things in the organization, not giving back. So understand that mutual benefit relationships aren't necessarily just money. You don't have to throw money at everything. Um, I encourage you to think about what sort of things you can exchange. I'll give you an example. I have done a lot of work for my affiliate and they've offered an opportunity for me to do <clears throat> the advanced facilitator training for NAA next year. Not necessarily dollars and cents, but also an investment to the organization as well as myself. We have to be out of the box thinking, what can we do for our DEI leaders to support them? If we can't put money in their pockets because that's not the relationship we have, what are the opportunities? Who are the mentors we can bring into the space? Who are the other organizations doing things similar so they can have a soundboard to do the work that they need to do easier, right? We talked about all these obstacles. So I just want people to really sit with the idea that Mutual benefit relationships are not just money. It's all about opportunities to create sustainability for our leaders in a way that they feel supported. Um, and, and think about it like this, the quality is not always equity. They're, they're two different things. And what another leader may need to be successful can be different than what another may. And I think when we think about how DEI is so nuanced and what some, a person in that role could be experiencing, then we can really give true considerations and genuine thought to how to build a mutual beneficial relationship. All right, we're gonna go one more slide over James because usually, because we, me and Crystal Proctor a lot, usually we just open the floor for questions, but I want to kind of lead in with some reflection questions for you. And then of course, open up the Q&A as always. Um, so the first thing I have for everyone is really taking the time to reflect and pause. And, and I, I don't want people to think like DEI is a mountain you have to move every day. It takes small grains of sand, right, to make change. So how can you foster an environment where DEI leaders can authentically connect with others. You may be in a middle manager role, you may be in a higher executive role where you can actually create these spaces, but really think about how you can foster an environment where these leaders can authentically connect. And if you have any recommendations that you're willing to share, feel free to drop those in the chat because I think it helps people start to think outside of the box on how they can create those genuine connections. While you do that, I'm gonna preface the second reflection question. <laughs> so the second question has to do with that glass ceiling I mentioned. And I wanna to speak to the phenomenon of the glass cliff. If you've never heard of that, can I see a question emoji in the chat? Have you heard of the glass cliff? Well, let's see, got some questions. Okay, okay. Yes. So yes. the glass cliff, we're gonna take the glass ceiling even further. Have you ever been in a position um, as a marginalized person, no matter your identity, where maybe you were placed in a work position that um, set you up for failure, that really wasn't ever gonna get you promoted, but based on your identity, you were maybe the token person, right? To complete the task. Um, so imagine a second layer to the glass ceiling, which is glass ceiling you just can't push through, can't break through. But glass cliff means there were characteristic details and <laughs> notes that you didn't quite get, right? That put you on the edge of somewhere that is just as fragile and can fall out from under you. And a lot of times DEI leaders are experiencing the glass cliff. So I leave you with the second question, which is how can understanding the challenges and experiences of these leaders and breaking the glass ceiling or preventing them from hanging on that glass cliff can lead to a more thriving and inclusive industry? Really think about that. What are some equitable practices? What are you seeing that maybe aren't quite fair, right, in your eyes? And, and what can you do as a leader to really build people up professionally and personally? So uh, that's a lot. I gave you a lot to think about. But of course, before I pass it to James, I just want to make sure we open the floor to any questions. And Crystal, if you had any last minute comments, I definitely want to make sure you have an opportunity to do so. No, Monica, that was great. <laughs> 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 As always, um, I'm looking in the chat box. Um, and James, yeah. I didn't know if you wanted to open it up to questions. Absolutely. If anyone has questions for Crystal or Monica, feel free to drop those in the in the chat or in the Q and A box. We'll be happy to answer. And if you don't have a question but you learned something new, throw me some emojis. Let us know. Yes. <laughs> I love to see everything in the chat. I love to see everyone connecting and, and being involved. So that makes me very happy. So thanks to everyone.
for participating and and chiming in in our discussion today. Absolutely. Ooh, we got one. What is our favorite DEI quote? I said mine already um, about being an inclusive leader. So by uh, Jennifer Brown. So it's on you, Monica. Man, can I quote myself? I don't know. Yes, I, don't I quote you often. You, Dana, Aisha, I quote you all often. So yes, you can quote yourself. <laughs> I don't have a formal quote, but... I'm a really big proponent about the social capital risk. So I just really focus on really it takes DEI leaders stepping outside of their shell, walking on that path of uncomfortability first. And the question is, will you walk with them? And I don't think that a lot of us want to leave our leaders and our cohorts alone. So I think it's okay to say, hey, I'm not comfortable crossing this bridge. And there will be a community of folks who will help you. So I don't have a formal, and I got to work on a quote now. God. <laughs> all right let's see what else we got going on um just answering a question here um oh the book funny enough you guys i keep the book handy oh this is what it looks like oh no yeah okay well almost almost yeah y'all got it <laughs> <laughs> um okay so there is a question from you uh for you any tips on starting a DEI committee at a local affiliate That's absolutely yes um first is buy-in start to have the conversations with people um one-on-one -on -one who are interested you're gonna need sponsorship you're gonna need allyship um because to formalize any task force or anything like that you're going to need the buy-in of your board and you're going to want people to help you with that if you don't already have those connections. Uh, when I think about the first stages of our committee, it was about finding a voice. You don't have to come out the gate celebrating every cultural holiday you haven't researched, right? We don't want that. Um, but we do want you to feel like you have a voice and a mission. So I think for me, I would highly recommend start with getting your folks in line strategically and also those who, who have the passion but also figure out what is the voice of your DEI committee in respect to your membership. Are you one heavily in the South where you may focus more on certain issues where maybe you're in a place that has a lot of religious diversity, you may focus there. All to say is you just wanna cater your committees or task force voice to your membership. And then from there it makes it a lot easier to start to you know, celebrate certain things, have editorial pieces, have education events and things like that. So hopefully that was what you were thinking of, but of course, please connect with me and I will dialogue all day. <laughs> um, there is another question for you from Salone. How do we affiliates not add pressure um, to you to have shared about, hold on a second. Okay. How do we affiliates not add the pressure you have shared about to someone in the DEI space when asking them to lead or to present? We are asking them because we respect their command of the content and their experience not to check a box. I love that. I think you tell them that. Hey, Crystal, I know you have a huge network and resources of people who are well-versed, who are looking for opportunities. I have this opportunity. How can I help? Or sometimes you just like a person and you want them to present, right? Hey, Monica, I really, you know, really enjoy what you do. Would love for you to speak on this. But if that's not within your bandwidth, if you have any referrals, I think the whole point is to not make the tokenism like you have to accept it, right? It's just, you want to express the respect that you have for this person, but also leave room for them to say no. And I think that's what we have to be mindful as affiliates with our DEI leaders is we're also at a pressure to say yes to everything DEI. and i don't, don't get it twisted, right? We are also under that same pressure. So leave room for the opportunity for something different or a referral so that that burden isn't necessarily, again, uh, oneness. It's not that one person's to bear. Awesome. Um, oh, more questions. Okay. Best advice to those that are new to the DEI space. Um, oh, I'll, I'm going to chime in a little bit here. <laughs> um, I will say, um, do the research. Um, it's there's so many resources available for you. In fact, the NAA has um, an awesome uh, space uh, for resources um, in multifamily regarding DEI. So definitely check that out. Uh, Monica and myself, we have tons of resources that we can provide to you as well. James, I'm not sure if we have the opportunity um, to send you um, like a handout with those resources that you can send with the video, um, or you actually yes, just put the absolutely. link up. 
Yes, for sure. For me, um, being new to the space, it was very, very important for me to have community. So um, I have a group of friends and they are friends to me now um, that I go to often and I'm able to be um, open with them about the experiences that I've faced, what I am facing, the obstacles that I'm facing, the questions that I have. Um, so community is very important. Um, you want to surround yourself um, with people who can answer these questions for you and have experience as well. Um, so I will definitely say that that's important for your someone new to the DEI space. And honestly, I am a reader. I am a friend ever reader. I read anything I can get my hands on. <laughs> I have a four-year-old, so it's harder now, but um, I do try to read anything I can get my hands on. And I just, I read all of the time. I do understand that there are some concepts that are just totally new to me and to really understanding how I can be active, how I can be an advocate myself. Um, I'm diving into it. I'm diving into what the experts have to say, the people who've done the work and who've had the experiences before me. So if you're new to DEI, definitely check out the resources that are available for you. Um, read, um, but, but do the work and stay the course. It's not easy. Um, it is an uphill battle often, um, but don't get discouraged. And if you find yourself being discouraged, hey, you have two people you can come to all the time, right yeah. in front of you, right. Monica or myself, and we'd be more than happy to speak with you about it. I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add to that, Monica. No, you killed it, knocked it out the park. I wanted to make sure we got to all the questions because it's it's popping. Yeah. Um, it's going so fast. I feel like I may have missed some questions. I'm um, catching back up. So one of the questions was from Lindsay. She asked, how can DEI leaders involve themselves in legislative advocacy to further initiatives? So I just want to touch on that real quick. Um, I'm going to lean back on my part of the presentation that talked about presence and positionality. I, Andre Valle is our one for PAA. He's our legislative chair. I email the chairs every year for a sit down. I don't even know what we're going to talk about, but I want to make sure that they have connections with me within the DEI space. And when I speak to presence, I show up. So advocacy day, I try to show up. I try to be present. I want to make sure that people know we're here and not just for the DEI stuff. So Lindsay, my advice would be just presence of positionality, meet those people, show up, be present, show that you're able to reciprocate the support. And you'll be surprised the sort of dialogues you get into for sure. Perfect. Um... It says, uh, oh, this is from Lala. How do you ensure that all people feel like DE&I is for them and not just for those that are marginalized? Um, and I can actually let you speak to that as well, Monica. Um, but I do want to say it's very important to create these spaces. So within our company, um, we have what we call inclusive spaces. So we have an internet um, and we have um, different spaces for all of our associates can be involved. And we make sure that when we are highlighting a specific group, we give everyone the opportunity to be involved. And honestly, this is a whole nother conversation. I'm not trying to start a whole nother conversation, but it's very important that people understand that DE&I is just not black and white. Okay. A lot of people hear those words, they hear diversity, and that's immediately what they think. So when you are trying to uh, create these inclusive workspaces, it's very important to involve everyone and let them know about the many different layers of DE&I. Um, and I definitely think creating these spaces where people feel free to express their experiences, to ask questions, to be involved, um, it lets everyone be a part of, of the, the um, progress of your DEI or your DEIB program um, and your inclusive workspace. Uh, Monica? I'm going to go back to my equity pie example is that I cannot take pie from someone that doesn't know I'm going to take it, right? <laughs> so it's the concept that you do need people who, who don't necessarily identify as marginalized to be a part of the conversation because they hold a lot of power and privilege to make change. And like Crystal said, that could be a whole nother hour session. So I'm going to leave you with that to Google, but just, you know, sit on that. And I, I didn't want to go too far because there was a lady, uh, I believe a lady, Jackie Pierce. She didn't necessarily want it to be asked, but I thought it was a really good question. And maybe Crystal, you'll have input. With the current climate of, let's say, recent events, um, what does allyship look like when the circumstances are complex? Hmm. I think that... Um... So it's weird. 
So I have a very good friend <laughs> who says, uh, being an ally is not a noun, it's a verb, right? You get involved. Um, even if that means um, listening and showing up for someone when something is happening. Um, because uh, for me, I there's so many examples. And again, I don't want to start a whole nother conversation, but there, um, there are a lot of world events that are occurring. And I feel like, while I have my feelings, I don't have a deeper understanding of what is happening. So for me, again, I choose to research, but I I, I have a space where I can ask questions um, and I have to learn how to show up for people. I just can't assume that what I think needs to be done is what they need. So asking those questions to learn how to show up for those people, I feel like that's how I can be an ally um, in certain situations. And I, I don't go into it thinking that I have all the answers or everything that I say is right. Um, I definitely go into it understanding that most of what I think is probably incorrect. Um, but being open in that sense and asking those questions, um, I think it's important um, that you do that because that that then lets you know how people need you to show up for them. Um, I don't know if that that helps. Monica, you are the wordsmith here. You probably have a better answer to that. No, I'm just going to compound off of it, which is I teach a lot about allyship and the concept of decentering. And one of the biggest issues of allyship is people don't want to be wrong, right? You don't want to be embarrassed for saying the wrong thing. And um, not all of us have mentors like Marcy French has corrected me on some of the lexicon and the words that I use in front of others that may be perceived to me as slang, but could be offensive to others, right? So I say that is, you can't always be worried about how embarrassed you are because learning is not embarrassing, it's invigorating, it's empowering. And so when you have an opportunity where maybe you fall short, you say the wrong thing, the message you have maybe implies something you didn't intend, that active listening component that Chris was talking about, the just hearing how it can make a person feel and making a commitment to not do that action or have that intentionality again is step one. And you don't have to feel embarrassed about that because if I know you're going to do better, why would I make you feel bad about that? I am going to support you, provide more resources. I'm going to welcome the change. And if you're around people who maybe don't do that, well, I'm not saying change your friend group. I'm just saying you can hang out with me and Crystal and we're going to help you, right? So I say all that to say is allyship is complex because you don't always know how to say the right thing or do the right action, but it's the aspect that you're willing to learn and make the mistakes and do better. Again, you're not going to make everyone happy. Me and Crystal are forever learners in that respect, but it's one of those things where you have to have that component of allyship, that decentering. It's not all about you and uh, you'll be way more successful at it. Agree. Beautiful. I think we got all the questions, James. I, I, think I don't you're so fast. I think you did. <laughs> I I was going back through and I think we we caught them all. Um, awesome. So Crystal and Monica, thank you both for <clears throat> a phenomenal second session for DEI Awareness Week. And for everyone online, we're going to come back again tomorrow and we're going to have some even some other fun. Uh, so please mark your calendars to join us 2 p.m. Eastern time. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this week for more sessions as a part of NAA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Awareness Week. Um, with that, everyone have a fantastic rest of your Tuesday, and we will see you tomorrow.